aspect of uh, communication and the environment of the communication specialist for uh, extension. So just a couple of really good things I want to say before introducing Graham to start to speak about the role of hunting and conservation is what I study is not you know how to promote hunting or like that, but what are Wisconsin citizens' attitudes kind of toward hunting. And in recent statewide poll work we did, about 64% of Wisconsin citizens said that they're uh, supportive. There was 20 some people, but 25 said they're neutral, and about 40% were you know against something. But I think it's an interesting thing that raises a lot of kind of, of passions. You know, that some people are strongly against it, some people are strongly for it, probably a big center group that say it's okay, but not for me, that kind of thing. But it, uh, I think hunting is just thinking about a lot of things like 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 food systems morality, like sustainability, like, you know, wildlife habitat, you know, protection. So there's a lot of threads in this. And so I'd like to um, introduce Randy Stark, who's going to kind of give us a perspective or set of perspectives on hunting. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Brett. Well, thanks everybody for being here. Um, this is a big topic, and we try to give justice to it in, 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 a, in a little bit here. But what we are going to do is kind of fly over this at 50,000 feet. We'll look at some kind of highlights. And uh, maybe we'll bore into a couple of stories that give us some insights into this. Um, and the conservation movement or the environmental movement is a big deal. I mean, there's a lot of uh, a lot of people involved in, in that fabric. What we're gonna do today is only pull one thread, we're gonna pull one thread of that big fabric of the conservation environment movement, and only talk about hunting and we could spend a lot of time talking about Rachel Carson changed her thinking environment the relationship to it. We can talk about Andrew Nelson and how he changed thinking, how, how the two merged together and, 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 and all those kinds of things. Um, but what we wanted to do here is just talk about maybe the role of hunting. So, so it's not to suggest that up here where we talk about or read it says pursuit of wildlife seems to have provided a crucial first contact with the natural world that spawned a commitment to its situation. Hunting is just one way. There's all kinds of ways to do it, so we're just going to pull in that one thread. Um, what I'd like to do uh, also is I'm going to leave up here um, some, some books that you can, um, if you want to carry on and education yourself, you can do that and put it in there. Uh, can everybody see this okay? Do you want to you kill it other light or are you okay with that? Okay. Well, the first thing I want to do is just play a short video. Das hier ist mein, das hier ist das wichtigste Gerät des Wissens. Das ist das Überlebens, ja. Challenges we may face today. 
Why is it important? I think everybody in this room understands that everything ultimately we care about, the economy, quality of life, or health, everything is ultimately subsidiary of our natural resources. Bottom line. I could stand here for a long time and hope we can come up with much of anything that isn't ultimately tied back to our natural resources. It's very important. It's important that we appreciate the next time you go out and use the uh, public roads in any way that you choose, whether it's hiking, biking, hunting, fishing, whatever you do. But we appreciate how these things have come across the generations to us. And maybe perhaps drive some inspiration to carry on and learn something going forward. The historian David McCullough said that no such thing as a self made man or a self made woman were all shaped by people we never met. And that's what we're going to do here is kind of maybe get an introduction to people that we never met that have set the stage for what we have today. I want to do this brief introduction to the North American model of wildlife conservation to set a stage for um, and how it came to be. We'll just follow this trail very quickly. But before we do that, you need to understand kind of what the pillars of this are, what the, the foundation. Um, it's a conceptual framework that guides um, wildlife management efforts in a couple things. That the public, the, the wildlife is a public resource. Now that seems obvious today, but it wasn't always that way. That wildlife and, and, and resources are placed in the arms of a democracy. That people get to participate in how that gets used. There's prohibitions in commerce and wildlife, which you'll see why. <coughs> There's a pillar about using science to manage wildlife, that we use science to make decisions, and that wildlife is a national resource. You know, wildlife, the international boundaries, that's man-made boundaries, wildlife doesn't respect them, so we need to cooperate across these boundaries. So, so this we take for granted right now, but how did it get to be that way? Um, so we're going to make a couple of quick stops. The first uh, stop is a fellow by the name of George uh, Perkins Marsh, um, who by, by most accounts, laid the foundation for conservation movement in a book called Man and Nature. What you need to know about this is that uh, Marsh was, um, he spoke several languages, he ended up being an ambassador over in, in Europe, and so he saw over in Europe kind of how what the implications of man's actions can be on the environment, and he wrote this book in, about Man and Nature that provides some historical profiles about ancient civilizations that failed but didn't didn't basically create sustainable practices. So what he did through this book is basically created the ideological foundation for conservation about sustainability science and that it's, it matters to future generations. If you could sum up Marsh's book in a quote, it would probably be this one. It says, our natural resources aren't limitless. Our own self-interest dictation can afford to be short-sighted and how we use them. If we want to pass them on to future generations, undiminished, we got to do it through sustainable practices that strike the corporate balance between human industry and nature's capacity. Now, remember that this is a manifest destiny at this time, the 1860s. This is fingernails on the chalkboard to people because this is about um, progress. The railroads are going to the West and we're expanding greatly, and to suggest that there's limits wasn't popular. So, um, so he lays that foundation now. So the next piece I'm going to talk about is how does the wildlife get in the arms of the democracy? And that comes from two cases that I'm going to briefly talk about. Martin versus Waddell was a case with an, an oyster case over in New Jersey and the Meadowlands. And basically the addition of the case was who owns the oysters? The, the, the person that owns the bed underneath them? Or can this oyster fisherman still take it? And in that case, the court said, they don't belong to the, to the owner of that. So that's a very significant first case about who owns the wildlife. And then it's driven home in 1896 in New versus Connecticut. They talk about free roaming wildlife, and they say, wildlife is held in trust for the benefit of all people. That is huge. That's very, that's huge. Um, it provided, it put the wildlife in the, arms, in the arms of the democracy. And as long as people stay engaged in it, in the democracy, and the vitality of democracy, we can have, have input into how the wildlife do. And it actually set the stage for licensing in the future, which we'll come back to. Now, we're going to fast forward to the kind of the Gilded Age, because that's when a lot of this work takes place. And the Gilded Age is, as you know, is, is most famous in the creation of the modern industrial economy, rapid economic growth, rapid population growth, moving out to the West. It's a period that people began to realize the impact people could have on the resource. So this is the context that we can look at it. It can be in market hunting, and urbanization, and logging, and population, 
habitat degradation. A lot of changes, the impacts of man as we go to the west and, and, and have contact with these resources and what happens to them. I'm going to use, um, by way of introduction, a wonderful book here. I would suggest that you um, read this book. Um, it's Last Stand, it's a story about the buffalo. And I'm going to use the buffalo as being emblematic of what happens in, in the conservation story. Early 1800s, estimated there's probably 30 million buffalo on the landscape in this country. All right, Lewis and Clark go out there and discover everything that's out there, and then America follows in their footsteps, and the railroads come out, and we get access to the West. Well, it isn't long. Um, in a short 100 years, by 1902, there's 23 buffalo that we believe were remaining at that time. 30 million buffalo to 23. So what happened? Uh, First off, you've got to remember that this was in this time when people believed in the inexhaustibility of our natural resources. How could we use them all? Look at this as about, this country's full of them. How, how, how do we, how can we possibly denigrate them all or our position? But what we learned is that our feathers and women's hats or hunting buffalo for skulls and hides or market hunting for, for, for waterfalls, that we could decimate wildlife populations. That, that, that in fact, happened. Great examples of passenger pigeon, you know, there's accounts of the skies being black with them. And if you look at going from skies being black with them to the last one dying in, in 1914, I believe it was, in captivity. But look at what was happening, they're commercializing on, on this resource. Michigan sent a million birds to markets, uh, and two years later, sending 400,000 a week. And so, we were feeding commercial markets with wildlife, and so it was decimated. And, and the result, as we know, so whether it be the buffalo, the passenger pigeon, or other other ways that this dramatic dramatic decline in species such as buffalo and passenger pigeon um, start to kind of shake this belief that our resources are inexhaustible. So I need to kind of tell you that part because now we're going to get into okay, where do hunters really start to, to kind of get involved in this conservation? And the first person I want to talk about is George Bird Grinnell. And George Bird Grinnell's fingerprints are everywhere in the early conservation movement. You can hardly read anything that has anything to do with conservation without finding Grinnell's foot or fingerprints on it. He grew up uh, in, in a, a, a fairly well-to-do family. Uh, his father wanted him to continue his business. He was wild about that. The family moved over into New York, over by Central Park, and happened to be next to the Audubon family. Uh, and, and Audubon's wife, after, after Mr. Audubon died, kind of took George Bird Grinnell under, under her wing. And from her tutelage, he became abundantly interested in the natural world. And that, well, that, that shaped his thinking. And what really changed him is in 1870, he went on a marsh expedition out west to do some paleontology with pigs. And he learned by digging up skeletons of things that had gone extinct that this can really happen. And he, he became concerned when he saw what was going on in the West. And so he dedicated his life, basically, to conservation. And he entered one out on one interesting part in, in 1876. He had an opportunity to go on another expedition that he didn't go on with a fellow by the name of Custer. So if you ever do some reading about George Bird and everything he did, what would have happened if he had decided to go on that one? <laughs> um, so what does Grinnell do? Um, first off, and he's responsible for many things. Um, you know, Yellowstone, Glacier National Park, and we'll get into some of that. He writes a stream of editorials for 35 years that penetrates the consciousness of, of thinking about conservation, enhanced awareness of conservation, political engagement, and, and to advance the cause. He created the Sportsman's Code, which was very important because the, he wanted to distinguish between a market hunter and a poacher and a commercial hunter between someone who would hunt for sport and hunt within regulations and have honor for, uh, you know, the, the, for the wildlife that they were pursuing. He wanted to distinguish that, so he set up rules that if you're going to be a sportsman, then you have to act differently. And you need to be part of the effort. And, and, and he separated behaviors from market hunters from, from, from sportsmen. Created this code and then uh, encouraged sportsmen to mobilize and and, and, and to act, act, get actively involved in the plus proliferated, particularly the 
including Profit Club and the seat of the role they played in Yellowstone. He was that person that said, hey, as sportsmen, if you're going to hunt this way, you're gonna, that we're going to create licenses and you're going to help pay for conservation. And so back when we got wildlife in the arms of the democracy, that set the stage to say, to add some value. Immediately, value was created on wildlife out of thin air when, when it was put, when, when it's held in the public trust. Agencies came on board and said, if you want to hunt but in this framework of regulations and seasons, you're going to pay for the privilege to do that, and we're going to use that money for conservation. Grinnell, he was way ahead of his time. And he also founded the Audubon Society after his, his mentor. Um, so it was Grinnell's ideas and Roosevelt's character, Peter Roosevelt's going to come along, that coalesced into a social movement around conservation. This is the, the, one of the publications that Grinnell, for 35 years, wrote about. This is a, the header of the first uh, subtitle of the, of, the, of the magazine in 1873. He said, the weekly journal devoted to field and aquatic sports, a practical natural history, fish culture, the protection of game, preservation of forests, and the inculcation of men and women for the healthy interest in outdoor recreation study. Now, we, we do, that, that's what this is about. I mean, this whole institution we're in here. But this is something that is brand new for him to kind of put this in people's minds at this point that, hey, you know, we're going to create kind of a, a community. <coughs> and, and so he uses this, this publication to do that. Um, he uh, advocates for the creation of sportsmen's clubs. And, and if you're going to join these clubs, then you need to be uh, adhere to the sportsman's code that he put together. And, and, and most of the people in the early clubs, they were well-to-do, politically influential, rich people. And so you had these people pulling up against other, other interests in the use of natural resources. You see the, the, the perpetuation of state game laws. Um, most of these early state game laws, were the establishment was influenced by sportsmen's groups where they saw what the pot hunters and the commercial hunters were doing, and they wanted to kind of they wanted to, hey, we need to, to, to protect these resources. And granted, the motivation was for the purposes of hunting. But they advocated for those laws, and, and most all of the early laws were, were, uh, were advocated by sportsmen's groups as they proliferated across the country. Every state in the 1870s started to stand up these clubs. Early on, there was no enforcement, there was no game wardens. Not until 1879 in Wisconsin, the first game warden show up. Um, but to set the stage for a couple of uh, important developments, in 1888, George Bird Grinnell and Theodore Roosevelt get together and they create the Boone and Crockett Club. And this was 100 prominent people. They, they limited the number of, of folks that were involved. And so they create the Boone and Crockett Club. And, and whether you, regardless of how you feel about Boone and Crockett and everything that you stand for, um, they have this first meeting and they decide that one of the things that they want to do is to use the influence they have to try to influence protecting Yellowstone National Park. And so we'll kind of pick that story up here because it's, it's, a, it's kind of an interesting story that blends a number of things together. Um, what happens is in, in 1872, well, actually in 1870, a couple of expeditions go out because they had heard about this Yellowstone National Park and these geysers and all of this natural wonders out there. Jim Bridger talked about it. And they sent a couple expeditions out to go, is it really true that this stuff is out there? They sent some folks out there, and sure enough, uh, this is what they find. And one night at a campfire, a couple of folks decided, you know, what, we, what should we do now that we found this, this natural heritage we have? We decided that uh, a couple, that they would try to advocate to protect it. In 18, by 1872, they set aside uh, Yellowstone, the boundaries of Yellowstone National Park. But the problem is, is they have no plan for it, there's no enforcement, there's no rules, no regulations. And over the course between 1872 and 1894, um, there are threats to kind of split it up. Developers want to develop it, they want to put a railroad through it. They, and, and, and George Bergenel, through a, a stream of editorials and, and working with Boone and Crockett Club, push that interest back and at least keep the, the Yellowstone, for the most part, intact. Now there's a, there's some wonderful stories that you can read in, in here if you like, but so what happens is by about 1894, 
the buffalo population in and around uh, Yellowstone is somewhere between two and 500 buffalo. And so that Yellowstone, not only is it valuable for its assets it has, but it's also valuable now as a place for the remaining buffalo. And the buffalo poachers knew this, and there's no enforcement, so at one point it got, it got, it got very bad, that they had corrupt administrators of the park, they finally send the cavalry in. And the cavalry, although they send the cavalry in, they, they can't, there, there's no penalties. All they can do is if they catch somebody shooting buffalo, is, is confiscate their equipment, walk them to the edge of the boundary of the park and say, see you later, and of course the next day they're back. So a guy by the name of George Anderson becomes the, the, the cavalry officer that's in charge of, of the park. And there's this, this poacher by the name of Edgar Howell, who they've been chasing for a long time, and they know Howell is now in the park, it's in the winter, they're gonna send a patrol in to try to find him. It's very dangerous to send a patrol in, and they wanna make sure he's in there when they, when they go in there. They gather some intelligence, and sure enough, they find he's in there, they send a small crew in, they find some tracks with a sled that was consistent with the tracks that he used to go in there to carry his equipment in. And while they're going in there, they, they find five buffalo heads. What, what he had done, he had shot these buffalo, cut their heads up, and it was 500 bucks a pop in those days, hung them in a tree, because he can come back and get them in the spring. And so, and they find this cache, and they find this track, and they track him down, and this very dramatic moment comes where they, they, while they're tracking him, they hear six shots, and they go, and there's, there's Howell beginning to skin out the first of, this, of the dead buffalo he just shot. And, that, and this is now six dead buffalo out of two to five hundred that are remaining. They have 200 yards to close between him and his rifle and his dog that he has with him. The cavalry people close the gap and they end up arresting him. And what happens is, as luck would have it, one of the kind of correspondents for George Stuart Grinnell was present in the park. And Anderson is pretty sharp, and he gets this guy involved and interviews Howell and tells Howell tells how, yeah, if I get out, I'm just gonna go back. Uh, I'll be back and I'll get 500 bucks. And, and, uh, and basically it's clear that without any enforcement or penalties, nothing's gonna stop this. Grinnell plasters uh, field and Forest and Stream magazine for weeks on end with what's going on, with the pictures of the dead buffalo. All this, and finally, after 20 years of hard work, and after this incident with Howell and, and Grinnell putting it out in public, 56 days later after Howell was captured, we get the first federal law designed to protect wildlife on the park. So, what the Boone and Crockett Club, Grinnell and others worked very hard. Lacey was a legislator from Iowa at that time. Worked very hard. I tell you that story because there's a lot to it about 20 years of effort, how to bring these things to the attention of the public, about some public engages in the democracy and the wildlife that's in the hands of the democracy. And it wasn't always that people paid attention. So if there's, a, there's a role that was played here you know, by the hunting public in this whole story. It's one of the threats to the um, so later, um, in 1900, Lacey also passes the Lacey Act of 1900, which makes it a federal offense to transport wildlife across state boundaries if it's taken in violation of the law, and the purpose of that, if it's taken in violation of state law, the purpose of that is to stop the commercial trade, and it's done that for hundreds of some years. We make Lacey Act cases all over <coughs> to, to this day. Anybody know who that is? Yes. Assassinated the Garfield. Yes. He fired probably one of the most important shots in conservation history. The shot that resulted in, 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 in assassination of the president, Kinley, so that Theodore Roosevelt could become the president of the United States. But we could talk about President Roosevelt for a long time. I encourage you, a recent book that came out, it says, uh, I was read the Wilderness Warrior. If you want to learn a lot about Paul Conner there. Uh, Roosevelt grew up in New York, young boy. He gets his first connection with the natural world in his own biography. He talks about a stuffed seal that's, that's on a sidewalk in New York City. He's petting it. He becomes very, very engaged with that. And, and, and grows up, he's an asthmatic young boy. He struggles uh, greatly with that. His, uh, he grows up, becomes a legislator in New York. His mother and his, and his, and his, uh, his, mother and his wife die in their house on the same day when he's in New York in a 
legislature, his, his wife gave birth to their daughter, and his mother died in the same day in the same house. And he wrote in his diary that something that affected my life, the light is snuffed out of my life. After that, he went out and was a rancher in South Dakota, came back into politics. He was a, uh, a commissioner of the police in New York. He was uh, ultimately uh, undersecretary of the Navy, became governor of New York. And the Republican Party at the time said, what can we do with this guy? Make him the vice president so he goes away, so he here. Uh, shots fired, all of a sudden, the cowboy's the president. So the, in, in the, what you need to know about Roosevelt is that, that basically he took conservation and turned it into a social movement. He used the bully call for the presidency to do that. Um, his enduring legacy is 230 million acres of public land. That's almost 80,000 acres a day of public land that was set aside in Roosevelt. We could talk for hours about the importance of Theodore Roosevelt, um, but the, the enduring uh, legacy of the land, um, refuges, Pelican Island was the first refuge. He used the Antiquities Act and the power of the presence. He pushed it to the limits on behalf of, of, of conservation. And while he was doing that to the end of his term, the, the Congress was going to take that power away from him because he had been using it so effectively. So they, set, they teed up a bill to take it away. But he, Roosevelt was a little too quick for him. He, he pulled a bunch of staff together to get for Pinchel, and they come into a great story about in the White House and Kitchen. They were circling the best properties to save before this bill passed. They sent a bunch of clerks and, and threw up land before the bill passed. And, and, and another millions of acres that but for that, that effort would have taken place. And I'm sure most all of us have stepped foot on those properties or benefited from those properties that were declared into existence. So, uh, Roosevelt is a key character for a lot of reasons. So Roosevelt comes on board with conservation uh, on the map. He, he is a hunter himself, and, and he understood um, the, the importance of conservation. And one of the things he did is he created this, this Declaration of Conservation, this Conference of Governors in 1908. And I just want to read for you briefly um, what, what, what the man says is says, we, the governors of the United States and territories of the United States of America, in Congress Assembly, do hereby declare the conviction that the great prosperity of our country rests upon the abundant resources and the land chosen by our forefathers for their homes and where they laid the foundation of this great nation. Opening line, closing line, let us conserve the foundation of our prosperity. I said it in different words about our resources being everything is a subsidiary of them. Roosevelt realized this. Very important. So let's fast forward in 1934 in Wisconsin as these um, sportsmen's groups proliferate across the country. Wisconsin creates the Conservation Congress, which is a great crowd of all of Leopold and several other folks. And essentially the purpose was so that citizens had a local avenue of input and to get information about that time the Conservation Commission and now the Natural Resources Board on Conservation Matters. In 1972, Patrick Lucy put it in the statute with the official um, advisory group to the Natural Resources Board. So we have a way to get input, again, keeping the natural resources in the arms of the democracy. Um, in 1936, Wisconsin has about 259 sports and clubs, about 40,000 members. And this is all going across the country, paralleling across states happening um, everywhere. Um, so let's talk about conservation in the Depression era, the era of science and revenue. We all know all of Leopold, the father of wildlife management. He creates the profession of wildlife management. Um, Leopold establishes wildlife management as a science with the ideas of let's have professional societies, so the wildlife society and a program we have here at the university accreditation system, government agencies, and professional game managers so that we have professionals making decisions, research projects, wrote the book Game Management that captured the essence of the science that, that, that he had um, to use to, to manage the game, and of course gave us the Senate from the Almanac, which is a very eloquent uh, articulation of, of, of our relationship with the land. Uh, so the science he brings to it. Revenue side, um, one of the key things that happens is the Pittman Robertson Act in 1937. And, and remember, remember this, is, um, this is in the Depression era, where the idea was that they were going to take, and using a tax on firearms and ammunition, 11% tax, take the money that's generated and use it for conservation. And so this was passed, um, 
and the, the ammunition companies bought into it. Now there's a very important part of the Pippin Robertson Act that goes along with that tax and the money that's generated. It's called the diversion clause. There's 29 words in the Pippin Robertson legislation. Which is a prohibition against diversion of license fee pays by hunters for some for other purposes. Why is that important? Because in the tough economic times when people are looking for money. People can go, what do you hear about you know, rating the transportation account? Well, what happened in the federal law, why that's important is that we're going to tee up this money for you states, but here's the condition. If you take the money, you can't divert license funds that aren't paid and you need to use that for conservation. Very important part of that. It, it locked that money in. And within 12 months of passage, 43 to 48 states at the time bought into that legislation. So since 1939, that tax has generated over $4 billion for wildlife management, um, our education. It's, been, it, it's, it's the essence of how we pay for conservation in addition to the concept of funding licensing. Uh, David Darling advocated for the waterfall stamp. Um, 1934, again, a depression era funding revenue source. Since then, <coughs> $750 million in dollars has been spent and over 5.3 million acres of waterfall habitat has been created as a result of that. So, in sum, hunters at this point contribute about $1.3 billion annually in the national level of conservation. Where does it spend? There's a, there's a pamphlet that uh, you, you may have, and, and so it goes to the agencies that for programs, um, you know, fish, wildlife, law enforcement, um, how to, the administration of licensing systems, that's where the money goes. By uh, wildlife properties, uh, access to places, hunt, things of that nature. Let's talk briefly about the economic impacts of hunting. If hunting were ranked as a corporation, it would fall in the top 20% of the Fortune 500, slightly ahead of global giants, global, general dynamics of Coca-Cola. So, hunting is a, is a pretty big economic engine. Um, you know, everybody knows the ripple impact of, 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 of the economy, but there's a, hunting is part of a $730 billion outdoor recreational community that tends to wave it through the, the economy. Um, on the national level, about 2.7 billion in retail sales, 66 billion in overall economic input, uh, output, I should say, 2.9 billion in salaries, 593,000 jobs, 4.2 billion in state and local taxes, 5 billion in federal taxes. On the state level, 1.4 billion in residential retail, that's third nationals in the country, 2.1 billion in economic output, 604 million in salaries and wages, 25,000 jobs. So it's a big economic uh, engine here in Wisconsin. So the upshot is, is that 1.3 billion in conservation annually as a result of some of these programs have a significant economic impact. <coughs> um, well, the North American model was made with wildlife in mind. It preserves communities as well as economies. It demonstrates that conservation efforts are in fact aligned with economic vitality. And so Without the wildlife, we, there's, there's this symbiotic relationship. Without the wildlife, we won't have the economy that goes with them. We currently have over 600 conservation organizations in the state of Wisconsin. Um, so they have proliferated greatly since George Bruggenell advocated for them. And a quick example of, of how, how this is used in Wisconsin is um, tur wild turkey restoration. Early 1900s, they were almost gone. And two groups of the NWTF and, and partnerships and our turkey stands. Now, tur well, turkey are everywhere except Alaska. And a recreational opportunity that's out there and it creates its own, its own economy around it. And we have turkeys back in the landscape. It's just an example of, of how this has worked. So I would suggest to you that, that um, in closing this, uh, a couple of thoughts. That, that we find ourselves at a, at a crossroads in conservation history these days. You know, we're going to write the next chapter. You, Kind of giving you a few of the chapters that are behind us. What's the next chapter? Um, you know, is it looking at uh, the number of hunters that are out there. When you look at the social trends, organization, age structure. Um, you know, the forecasts are that we won't have as many hunters. We're going to have, you know, this this funding source that I'm talking about will be less. So the question for society is, okay, if that's the case, how can we fix that? What do you do? Again, the population of hunters as a portion of the number of people, uh, 
what does that mean to conservation and why do hogs fun? And, and at least the, the, the hunting part of it. And some closing thoughts for you to kind of consider, and then we'll open up for questions. Is that over the last 130 years, some things have been that that certain game populations have been restored. Um, an array of other species other than game has been, been protected by virtue of the, the shared habitat that's created for the army. Uh, diverse public and political sectors began to realize the enormous value of culturally, economically, recreational, recreationally, as a, with a sustainable approach to wildlife. Um, this increased demand for protection of wildlife has created the proliferation of state agencies that are charged with protecting wildlife in every state in the union. Partnerships with landowners are critical in protecting. Um, international treaties were established, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and funding unique and, and, and innovative funding sources were created and they've endured for a long time. So if there's when we pull on that thread, that's kind of what we see out of that. And but also um, as you consider that hunting is also or consider this. Um, and what to think about. Um, hunting is one way to connect directly to the experience in the natural world. Um, hunting is a means for increasing and urbanizing society. Remember that we are, we don't weave the web, we're part of it. And what we do to the web, we do to ourselves. So that contact with the natural world is a way to experience, experience an element of the human existence that's critical to perpetuating the world that's both sustaining and sustainable. Having that contact with the natural world, and I I would give you a quick thing on contrast here. This came out of, um, it was a, a newspaper in Sacramento. It says, all you hunters who kill animals for food, shame on you. You ought to go to the store and buy me that was made there so for no animal would harm. I'm not critical of the comment as much as what does it mean if, if, we're, if we don't have a realistic apprehension of the natural world we live in. I'd like to share with you a perspective of Todd Lipper. Todd is a person that never hunted before. He happened to be a preacher. And he gave a sermon about his hunting experience. And you know, he was talking about it and never hunted before. He was teased by his fellow folks who didn't hunt. And I thought he kind of eloquently um, explained this. And I just want to take a minute to read this to you, but I think he sums it up wrong. It's a turkey hunt, it's a learned honey den. He's taken out there. <coughs> by Carl Batha, uh, one of our former wildlife managers, and he writes this. He says, turkeys are mating in spring. It's the season that the birds and the bees and love is in the air. The toms, the guys, will display their feathers and show how beautiful they are when the hand will come to mate. As a hunter, you try to mimic this. You take your squeak into the toys and try to make the hen sound like a tom turkey, or sound like a hen call to a tom turkey. Now, you may think this is cruel. After all, the tom turkey is just looking for a little love in it. And, and was waiting for him as someone who's looking for a little supper. Uh, but if we think about our own turkey eating, this is no more cruel than a bunch of butter bowl being loaded in the truck, going to the processing plant, so that we can pick up the things that we turn to wrapped in plastic at the grocery store. The difference is that when you're hunting, you don't outsource the dirty work, you do it yourself. He talks, he goes on to talk about the rest of the, this is the hunt came early. Uh, we were, we were to our site before 6 a.m. The woods, the turkeys woke up that day. The stars were clear and bright as we arrived. Jupiter faded into the eastern sky as the sun rose. Carl set up a deep voice, and I got the turkey blind into a camouflage tent to sit in. We waited and listened. As it became light, the woods woke up. I never experienced this before. It was incredible. At first, I heard some robins, and then some cardinals started calling. A group of horned owls started hooting. There, there, there had to be a dozen. They were, they were excited and loud and sounded like dogs barking. And, and he goes on to explain about there's some geese in the distance, and 200 yards off in the field, he sees a raccoon and two coyotes chasing in the bushes. And woodpeckers started to work in the racket, and then he gobbled God. And he closes the, the, the piece with, he said, I could have experienced all of this by simply being in the woods and observing. But the sense of awe and love of creation was heightened for me because I was there for food. Because I was hoping to take one meal from the land that the land was providing rather than what I could purchase in a grocery store. Because I was seeking to receive what I could provide myself rather than receiving provisions from someone else. I was invited to turn from being a consumer of creation to 
being a participant in it. I notice so much more. I notice the connections, the level of relationships. The soil provides nutrients for the grasses, which provide seeds and nutrients for the birds that find shelter in the oak trees, and provide the acorns for the turkeys that I hope to provide this opportunity in my family. My place was not outside of what but in it. I saw everything that depends on the same element, soil, water, one another, and the animating power that pulled all of our time. I, I, I share that with you because I think going forward, um, I would posit to you that no matter what your connection to the natural world is, understand that we are connected to it, that our food doesn't come from the grocery store, that our heat doesn't come from a heat register, that our water doesn't come out of the faucet. However you choose to gain that appreciation, it's an important element going forward in society as we bump up against the ecological boundaries of these ecological services that can be provided by the natural world. So I think it's an important way to have an experience for sustainability going forward. So in closing, these, these historical tracings are important and you reflect you among both hunters and non-hunters. And hunters along with many others have played a significant role in conservation achievements the only people on this particular side. So I bring you back to Saturday morning about how we ended up kind of getting here. Um, kind of a quick flight over the top of it. But how we came to have hunting licenses, how we had to come to have game rooms that will make sure that people follow the law, how we came to have a public that doesn't like poachers and calls in and wants us to catch them as opposed to working with them and buying their wares, how we got to have an economic vitality we have that's derived from hunting, how young people will make a connection to the natural world in this way, how people will, with friends and family, enjoy the outdoors get some exercise, get some high quality meat to eat with their family. So there's a lot wrapped up in this experience that's going to take place starting Saturday. So it's an appropriate time for us to talk about that and, and perhaps think about it. And so, and then Saturday evening, people are going to sit around the fire and talk about the experience that's been done for eons in this world. Quote from the book Deer on Wisconsin. For as long as people have hunted, they've banded together special kind of packs. The grown to moose tradition, sometimes the companionship and the ritual become more important than the hunt itself. The greatest pleasure found in the anticipation of recollection and the hunt itself serving to volunteer. So there's a social component to all of this at the same time. Cultural component <coughs> that is why it's woven deeply into the fabric of Wisconsin. So I will leave you with the same thing, is that one of the things that you want to learn more about the Sun's Network of Wisconsin purposes is to create a community around harm improvement and attention. Um, you learn more there. But the quote I started with was, the pursuit of wildlife seems to have provided a crucial first contact with the natural world that spawned a commitment to its perpetuation. Again, how you do that, whether it's through hunting, whether it's through going out of on society, Sarah Club, whatever it is that you do, hunt, fish, trap, camp, bike, doesn't matter what you do. Find a way to connect. Find a way to connect so that the commitment to perpetuation of the resource is there, no matter how you choose to connect with it. It's only fitting that we would leave with a quote from uh, Gail Nelson, one of my favorites, about know, the ultimate test of a person's conscience, maybe their willingness to sacrifice something today on behalf of future generations, is worth the thanks and money. Anybody who, who's met Gail Nelson in this room? Okay. Um, I have an opportunity to do that. I actually have a signed copy of the book. One of those things that Mark had an opportunity to talk to him. He's not here. But this institution is here. It's a legacy behind left behind. And I hope that by sharing some of this, you can see when we pulled this particular thread, that a lot of people left a legacy and, and generations can't thank them other than to redouble efforts to carry on what they start, whether it's John Muir, whether it's Teddy Roosevelt, whether it's Rachel Carson. Well, how we choose to carry on, how we choose to participate in this moment in history in carrying on the future of conservation is very critical. And, and you people, all of us, and particularly the younger generation, who the baton of society is going to be passed to you, how will you participate? How, what, what will your legacy be? What will be written in the next chapter in conservation history? People in this room are going to have a whole lot to say with that. 
And as Lincoln said, the past drives the future, and the current time will also drive the future. So thank you. We've got a great group of people to chat with. We've got about 15 minutes for questions or any conversation you want to have. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. didn't protect all wildlife, and Yellowstone National Park, in fact, tried to eradicate its coyotes, succeeded in eradicating its wolves, with really well-documented negative ecological consequences for Yellowstone. Yeah. So the sort of, the focus on ungulates and game species has had some, it's sort of had a bitter harvest that we're still inheriting, inheriting now. And I just feel like that's missing from this story. I'd like to hear your thoughts. Uh, I think it's an excellent point of uh, the tension between um, biodiversity and roles that wolves play and then on some quarters the adverse impact of wolves and the sustainable part of the social carrying capacity. Of course, ESA then protecting them or Lacey Act didn't. All of these things are creating for us value and conflicts. And part of what was our history, sometimes your history, uh, like, how it says, you know, shapes the way you think about it. So these things like the, the wolf situation, or, um, the place for wolves and, and what we value, this is, this is where we live in, and a lot of our history, as you say, brings us to this point. Now our, now our, our call is on as a public policy standpoint, where does that balance lie? I think everyone wants to find the appropriate balance between having the predators on the landscape, biodiversity, and the role that's there, on one hand, and then you have the other interest about what's the social capacity that, that society will accept in a representative democracy, and how do we find that in the point? And this is a struggle that we have right now. Obviously, a, a major theme is the, the, the land base is so important for the conservation aspect. Um, I have some land out in the southwest of Wisconsin, so some hunting in there. And they were, they're very appreciative of the hunting privilege now. I, I've heard from them and from other people that the amount of land available for public access to hunting is decreasing. Yeah. Any, any comments on that? Oh, issue sure. or how, how we A couple of things. Mm -hmm. Changing land use and ownership patterns. Um, take the, the uh, paper companies. Uh, five years ago, a lot of people got in their car and drove to a particular place to go hunting and that's what they did for 20 years. Today, they're not getting in the car and driving them because the paper companies are divesting themselves. Today, that square mile of paper company land is probably a bunch of 40s. That is private ownership. Um, so access to, to land is huge. Another piece of it that's connect, directly connected to the demographics, baby boomer generation. Currently, 60% of the people in this country uh, that own forested land are age 55 and older. So what will people do with that land? That the question becomes, what will their kids do with it? If you're a farmer, what's your retirement plan? What will happen with that land? You know, Jefferson realized that part of pursuing life would be and happiness in this country was the land base. That's why he bought everything between the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains for 13 and a half cents an acre. It was a far to find it. How many people have bought land and never stepped on it? Mm -hmm. But he realized the importance. So, huge issue. What we do to the land and how we manage that, particularly with private landlords who work in the future. Other questions? Fishing licenses, in terms of uh, our, our doing a little bit better, there, it's not quite, I think there's a social trends of age structure, urbanized urbanization, for about 80% of the land in the country. Urbanization has a greater impact on hunting participation than it does fishing participation. So fishing numbers are look better than hunting numbers. Uh, there's a, all, all kinds of other things that come into play with that. It's easier to go fishing than just to go hunting. A little more equipment that you guys come along with. If you need a mentor to kind of teach you that a little bit more than fishing. There's a lot of things in there that, that we're trying to address in this current net about how we do that. The fishing is a little bit better, but considerably. But that's still going on. 
Yeah. Right. Where do you think the money's going to come from in the future? Right? Sales, pretty clear. Every state's facing the same dilemma. They find any higher sales revenue and Wisconsin deer hunting licenses are leaky. And they're declining too. So what's your guess in the future? Where, where well, are we I, I think that this is going to be a question for society to do in terms of, first of all, what's a value question. As, as, as society ages and we have um, more and more people entering the age where they're the biggest drain on the healthcare system, myself included, society's going to have some tough questions about where they spend money. I think the answer to that question is going to lie, lie in this. In making sure that our public as a democracy understands that we our vitality flows from those resources. So that protection of those resources is job is a high priority. Because we can't, you know, if you have poor air quality and people have asthma, they can't really do it and your health care costs go up. There, in other words, what I'm trying to say is that it's all connected to our natural resources. So as a society, I think until we come to the understanding that that we don't have an economy without the resources to drive it. When we get to that point, I think that the answers will be abundantly clear. But I don't think we've got to the point yet where we, you know, human nature is such, you know, you have a crisis. And so when we, when, we, when we get there, I think society will respond and find ways to do this. I think it will be always a combination of things. It will be a combination of, you know, hunting will always be around, will always be but there ought to be alternative ways to think through how we fund conservation. And I don't know what the answer to that is. I think future societies, particularly um, younger folks in the room, this will be your question. We would be sitting, if we were sitting in this room four years from now, and I'm in a rocking chair, I guarantee our conversation will swirl around that issue about how, how, we, how we do that. Not only in this country, now in the global economy and everything else. So I don't have the answer, but I think it's going to be it's going to be an issue that's going to require clear. I don't mean to skirt the question, but I don't I don't know. I mean people talk about Minnesota just passed the sales tax on April percent. Um, you know every state has its own culture, every state has to decide for itself how it's going to do that. Um, well, the idea of a tax right now in the current political climate is almost suicidal. I mean, historically, you know, the duck hunters asked to be taxed for the duck stand. The NRDJ tax or fees are critical. But Missouri and Arkansas have that 1.81% sales tax, which has really helped her. But from that point on, political climate has been such for the warranty taxes. And I have colleagues in those states, and that's that uh, Missouri where I mean, they're down there, they're in the town, too. So there's, you know, uh, it's not panacea all the time as it, it, it can be. But I think if you take color from how we got PR money, how we got stamp money, it's, like you say, people ask for it. So in the future, the question will be, how do we get more people to ask? How do we want to do this? How do we want to pay? This is important. We need to do this. That's at the key in representative democracy is so that, you know, 75% of the people out there that that vote and, and, and are involved in where this country is going ask for it. What will it take to get there? That's the question. Yes? How big of a problem is baby? And what, why is there going to rise in that over the decades? Great question. Um, yeah, um, baiting is, the amount of baiting is gone up, and, and a couple factors there. Baiting is, is, is an issue, it, 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 it creates, there's disease implications, uh, conflict issues with it. As we have more property owners and more property land owners, we get competitive baiting going on. There's a little privatization of public resource by sucking animals on your property, and then it becomes a baiting contest as to who can outbait you. Um, there's a lot of issues associated with baiting. Um, right now, the community is it's, it's 
split. I mean, the pendulum's been swinging. There's more and more hunters that are getting kind of against it, but there's still uh, there's economic issues associated with it and why South Warren is somebody to do that. So it, it is a big issue. It's a controversial issue. Uh, legislative years ago, when we had that big ban and went through that, that was one of the most things that got the most calls on the careers of the um, So it, it, uh, it's one of those things that, that I think we, we educate the public about, and it's another one of those things that eventually, it took 20 years to get Yellowstone National Park squared away. It took issues um, to do that. I think if you ever see a, a TV break outbreak in this, in this state, or else in the fire industry, is that which is impacted. You know, it would be an event not unlike Edgar Howell, um, oh, not now, but, uh, but it's a big issue. I think the debate rages on and will continue to go on. Uh, and that, um, again, it's a public policy issue. Uh, our job as natural resources is to put it out there, put the, what, you know, what the issues are out for the public and what we decide. But that's what we do. How big are boundary issues getting to be as people bathe and grow food plots? And there's almost like a commoditization um, aspect to it because people want to draw or, or, or get here to their property. Um, just what it seems to me that you're we're hearing more and more about yeah. territoriality and boundary issues. That's right. And what uh, what's concerning to us in the law enforcement world is the conflict. You know, we all know sort of county issue. You know, we're seeing that conflict, and, and it is a direct result of. Of uh, you know, more parcels on the on the on the ground, which means more property lines to have disputes over. Overlay that with um, the baby and feeding and this entitlement mentality that can go with I put this out there, therefore I want it. And we see more of that particularly on public land where I used to hunt on the, on the public uh, on the paper company land. I show up one morning, there's a there's a new sign I can't hunt here, where do I go? Uh, where's the nearest state? I hope you have over here. I was said, now you're hunting where a family was 20 for the last 20 years, and you're in the middle of that. Hey, we got our skins here, and pretty soon, you know. So this is the dynamic at that play. 